From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, Welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. The fight for the gavel continues in the House as Steve Scalise struggles to secure the 217 votes he needs to become Speaker. The good news is our support continues to grow. We're continuing to work to narrow the gap. We'll speak from members from both sides of the aisle this hour. Congressman Mike McCall of Texas, chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz of Florida. The congresswoman also just returned from Israel, where Secretary of State Antony Blinken was today, underscoring U.S. support for the country amid its conflict with Hamas. Senator Bill Haggerty of the Foreign Relations Committee joins us with his thoughts as well. So, Joe, another busy day here in Washington and abroad as well. And while the conflict in Israel continues to loom large as an issue, frankly, the House of Representatives is not at this point in a position to really address it, as we still don't have a speaker, and it feels like we're not necessarily getting a whole lot closer to one either. Uh, No time soon. Uh, A remarkable turn of events again is around this time yesterday. Kaylee, it felt like we were on to something. Jim Mm -hmm. Jordan was set to endorse Steve Scalise. There was momentum. There was a so-called nominee. I'm not sure that nominee is worth a lot right now. You, among others at Bloomberg, spent some time today on Capitol Hill to take the pulse of Republican lawmakers. Here's what we heard. Time is of the essence. There's not that much time left. He told a lot of people he's going to be at 150. He wasn't there. So. We had it down to two people, two good people, and they made their pitch. Different people had different thoughts on spending and other things. So we'll see. It's uncharted waters. I'm never going to just say I'm a, I'm a never so and so. You know, we're adults. Let's go figure out how to lead. But I'm not in a uh, positive place right now with respect to Steve. And I said, well, if Jim Jordan's nominating Steve Scalise. Why wouldn't I support that move? Mm-hmm. Huh? Because I don't know how somebody can get on the House floor then and say, I nominate Jim Jordan. After Jim Jordan says, I'm nominating Steve Scalise. I'm not following Jim Jordan on that. I'm going to vote for Jim Jordan. I told Steve, um, if, we, if we go to the floor, I would vote for him. But uh, it's just not clear right now. I will nominate Steve on the floor. And I hope we can unite around uh, the speaker and get doing the work of the American people and helping our, our dearest and closest friends in the state of Israel. Joining us now are Bloomberg's Julie Fine and Nick Wadham. So, Julie, just to begin with you, as you join us from Texas, far away from Washington, and yet I'm sure a lot of people are there asking questions about what exactly is going on in this House of Representatives. It doesn't really seem like the Republican conference, at least at this moment, is capable of uniting around one person. Uh, Yeah, it certainly doesn't seem that way. I mean, you have one representative essentially saying, a Republican, that this is like an episode of Veep that turned into the House of Cards. I mean, that is not where you want to be when there is a war going on in Israel Aid is needed. There are questions about aid for Ukraine. So at this point, it appears they are no closer. You even have Mike Rogers basically saying, we're going to need Democratic votes. Nothing that I ever thought would happen this week. So they have a long way to go and a lot of work to be done. Well, that's for sure. Uh, Let's hear from the Democratic leader in the House. Hakeem Jeffries spoke today about what he thinks his colleagues need to do here. House Republicans need to end the GOP civil war. Now, what is the problem? House Democrats have continued to make clear that we are ready, willing, and able to find a bipartisan path forward. But we need traditional Republicans to break from the extremists and partner with us for the good of the American people. Julie, no one could have predicted the events of this week, just like we couldn't have predicted the events of last week. And we can't tell anyone what's going to happen next week. But it is starting to seem like it might involve Democrats. Is that how this ends? It could possibly involve Democrats. But, Joe, you know what that means? That's basically everybody completely splitting from the Freedom Caucus. Because right now, you know, there have always been these attempts to appease the Freedom Caucus. I mean, that really 
was what undid Kevin McCarthy. So if that happens, they finally said, we've had enough, we're splitting with you, and we're going to go to the Democrats. The question is, what do the Democrats want? I, they're not going to just say, okay, we're on board here. They're going to have to figure out what they want. There's going to be a lot of closed doors mm -hmm. about this. And this will basically mm -hmm. show that the Republican Party just simply could not do it by, by itself. Well, and if they can't do it and struggle to get a speaker, Nick, that means it's going to be a struggle to get any aid through Congress for Israel or otherwise. We know that there are steps the administration is taking on its own. Where is the limit of that? Well, uh, it's a great question because the administration wants to send munitions. They want to send aid, humanitarian aid. They have, they have a laundry list of things they want to send uh, to Israel. And that is not something they can do. They are, they are preparing a supplemental. We know this from having spoken with folks at the White House. That supplemental is on its way early next week. And they are going to want an answer very, very quickly. I mean, that, the uh, Hamas war could tur turn into a ground invasion by Israel within days. And you can bet the administration is going to want to have that supplemental in its back pocket by the time that starts. Let's zero in on that for a moment. I'm sure we have more to say about this speaker's race and the dysfunction in Washington. Uh, but do we have any sense of timeline here? There's obviously the matter of hostages in Gaza. Will there be more time allowed to get them out of Gaza before tanks or troops roll in? Well, that is really the question on everyone's mind right now. But the indications so far from Israel, I mean, very, very tough remarks from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu last night. Yeah. Uh, and other officials basically saying we are now at war. Every Israeli is a soldier now. And uh, by all accounts, given that the tanks and troops are massing on the border with the Gaza Strip, mm -hmm. it looks like they will be prepared to move in without securing the release of those hostages, though U.S. officials and Israeli officials are obviously working on that very hard right now. And of course, all the hostages and just all of the other human stories of everyone who has who has fallen victim to this conflict have been plastered all over televisions, all over the world, frankly. Julie, you, you just can't escape from it yeah. at this point. And I wonder how knowing some of the atrocities that are, that are happening and the horrendous images we are seeing reflects back on a House of Representatives that just can't seem to get itself together. Do we, should we expect that that is going to amplify the political pressure on the individuals in that chamber? I mean, I would expect that it would. However, that, you know, we've been seeing this and we've been hearing about this. I mean, part of it is the Senate is not in this week. So I think that maybe they feel like they have a little more wiggle room because they'll need both to act. But, I, you know, the bottom line is there is so much going on in the world. There is so much devastation there is going to continue to be pressure on the House of Representatives, the Republicans who are in the majority, to get this done so that they can help. And the longer this goes on, this becomes a bigger problem for them and a major problem as these nations need aid. We heard from uh, Secretary of State Blinken today in Tel Aviv, to your point, mm -hmm. uh, Nick, a pretty important visit for the Secretary of State who was looking and sounding uh, rather presidential. Uh, let's hear what he said about a widening itinerary for his travels. From here, I'll go on to Jordan, where I'll meet with His Majesty King Abdullah and with Palestinian Authority President Abbas. And then over the coming days, we'll visit with leaders in Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Qatar. Across each of these engagements, we'll continue pressing countries to help prevent the conflict from spreading and to use their leverage with Hamas to immediately and unconditionally release the hostages. He's the face of the administration, obviously, in the region right now. But we're also hearing from administration officials in Washington about this money, the $6 billion uh, that had been, I guess, unfrozen. Uh, now it looks like being refrozen uh, as part of the Iranian prisoner swap. Republicans on Capitol Hill have been making a lot of noise about this. Where, do, where does it stand? Well, I mean, the U.S., the Biden administration has said Iran is not going to get a cent of that money. I mean, this just feels like a different era. This was September, uh, you know, less than a month ago, the administration is trying to de-escalate tensions with Iran. And as part of a prisoner swap, they say, OK, Iran, you can have this $6 billion to spend on humanitarian goods and medicine. And now, I mean, just the, the political cost of allowing any money to go to Iran, given their alleged involvement, possibly knowledge of, but certainly longtime support for Hamas, makes that just utterly impossible for the administration. So uh, likely to expect that Iran's not going to see a cent of that money. How about that? 
Many thanks. Nick Wadhams and Julie Fine with us from Texas here on Bloomberg. Coming up, we continue the conversation on the war between Israel and Hamas and the plan for support from the U.S. I uh, came to Israel bearing a simple message. The United States stands with Israel and with its people. Today, tomorrow, every day. We'll have more on that next with Republican Senator Bill Haggerty and Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. One path forward is a region that comes together, integrated, normalized relations among its countries. Then there's the path that Hamas has shown in stark, clear light. Terror, destruction, nihilism. The choice could not be more clear. Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking earlier in Tel Aviv about the war between Israel and Hamas as it now enters its seventh day. We're joined now by Republican Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee, and I appreciate your time today, Senator. It's always good to have you with us. I wonder, first and foremost, and I realize that we're dealing with a dose of dysfunction here in Washington without, well, a functioning house, but as you look at the needs uh, of Israel right now and consider what we have available, what is it? that the U.S. can send in terms of military or financial aid to help at this time? Well, the U.S. has already approved uh, $3.7 billion plus uh, to move into Israel. I put forward legislation earlier to replenish the Iron Dome. I'm going to be bringing that legislation back to the floor. There are a number of things that we can do, but the most important thing that we can do, Joe, is to step back and show our moral support for Israel and let them get at this root of terror, which is Hamas. They need to exterminate this. And I'm very, very displeased with some of the message that we've heard coming from our own State Department. And you mentioned uh, you just played Secretary Blinken's comments. One of the things that Secretary Blinken leaves out is the role of Iran. And the administration has been somewhat silent on this, except they tacitly admit Iran's role when they say now they're going to freeze the $6 billion. But it's far more than $6 billion that we're talking about. Since the Biden administration came into office, they've looked the other way. They failed to enforce the sanctions on Iran. When I was ambassador to Japan, it was my job to get the Japanese to stop buying Iranian crude. In the previous administration, we had choked off the flow of funds to Iran. If you think about Iran as a river sending funds into their proxies like Hezbollah and Hamas, those proxies had dried up. They were running out of money. Today, they're flush because Iran has been allowed to bring in estimates are as high as $80 billion of excess revenues from illegal petroleum sales. The Biden administration looking the other way, not enforcing the sanctions. In fact, they're enforcing these sanctions the same way they're enforcing our border right now. It's pathetic. $10 billion that we know this administration okayed going from Iraq to Iran earlier this year. This is a big, big problem when we're funding the greatest sponsor of terror, and this is what we're getting as a result. Well, of course, Senator, the admi administration maintains that to this point they do not have concrete evidence that Iran was directly involved in this attack. In fact, we, it's our understanding that the administration has gotten intelligence that suggests senior members within Iran were surprised at the attack over the weekend. So keeping that in mind, but you referenced the, the sanctions on Iran. and we I would just like to interrupt there. This Bloomberg. administration has been infiltrated. We know the reports about this administration whom, being sir? infiltrated. By, by Rob Malley and by the uh, Iranian Experts Initiative, the influences that Iranian government wanted to put into our own administration at the highest levels of the State Department and DOD. So I don't really trust the competency of this administration and their intelligence right now on this subject. Well, what intelligence do you have, Senator? Because we've been hearing about this a lot. The, the Secretary of Defense actually spoke to this today. Lloyd Austin, surely you appreciate the view of the Secretary who said that while there is a history here, and he did acknowledge that, of Iran sponsoring terror in the region. They simply don't have the smoking gun or the documents that connect the dots on this. What do you know? <laughs> then why are they cutting off the $6 billion right now? Why are they freezing that? They're talking out well, of both sides of the Well, there's been calls to right do now. that from, from Congress. You're pleased to see that, I'm guessing, right? I, I certainly am. I think this is the right direction. We should go back to the policies that we had in place before that were working. 
those are severe economic sanctions on Iran. That will choke off the flow of funds that enable Hamas to do this. Look, I'm not making any defense of Hamas at all. This is a terrorist organization, and Israel has every right to defend itself. The Biden administration took too many days to come forward and say this. Their first comments were to, to, to step back, to, to not retaliate. Uh, the Secretary of State, I understand, was calling for a ceasefire before the Israeli government even had a chance to situate itself and respond to this. They have terror on their soil. This is a massive terror attack. We need to allow them to do this. We need to step back and give them the room to do it and the moral support. Senator, when you talk about intensifying sanctions potentially on Iran, and you specifically referenced oil, which is being produced in Iran and flowing out of it, we know a lot of it is going to China. There's a difficulty in enforcing yes. sanctions on oil that is going to China. Is that the, the best mechanism at this point? And do you worry about the ramifications for global energy markets, also keeping in mind your seat on the banking committee? Well, let's talk about the global energy mar markets, because I heard the National Security Council spokesman talk about the need to balance those markets. That's why they've looked the other way on sanctions. The best way to deal with this is to end the war on domestic energy in the United States of America. They precipitated this problem, and now they're going to terrorists to deal with it, looking to nations like Iran to sell illegal oil to keep the markets, quote, balanced, go to visit Venezuela and let them do this. This is preposterous. The Biden administration needs to look inward and stop this war on domestic energy. That has a great deal to do with this right now. Well, Senator, let's just talk about this for a moment, because uh, you clearly are upset with the Biden administration. Uh, surely you don't think the Biden administration is somehow a, a sponsor of terrorism. Aren't the, the talking points here, the rhetoric getting a little hot? Well, I would tell you this, and I, I was early on seeing this when I came into the administration, when I'm sorry, when I came into the, into the Senate uh, and saw this administration come into office and immediately began to renegotiate with Iran. We had Iran at a point where we were essentially choked them out of their economic means to sponsor terror. This administration comes in and starts immediately appeasing Iran. We saw what happened in the Obama administration with the appeasement strategy. In 2014, 2015, you know, the violence coming out of Gaza was immense. 2021, when Biden's back in, we had the 11-day war again. Now we have this. The flow of funds matters. The fact that the Biden administration put someone like Rob Malley, who is compromised, has now lost his security clearances, has been kicked out of the State Department without pay, is under FBI investigation, that should tell you that there's a deep, deep problem here. This administration has made a massive mistake trying to negotiate with Iran. And by looking the other way on the sanctions and allowing them to enrich themselves, they have, again, widened the river and expanded these tributaries in a way that is an enriched okay, Hamas understood. and other allies. I appreciate other your proxies. view on that. We just, we just want to be accurate about what's happening, that the, the funds have been frozen here, and the administration has, has had some pretty Only tough rhetoric Only $6 billion of the funds, Iran. to be clear, Joe. Okay. Only $6 billion of That's the funds. That's been Again, the call from Biden Congress the at way. this point. So, so just, just to understand, Senator, you've been talking about the Biden administration for the balance of our conversation. What do you want to see yes, Congress yes. deliver to Israel that will help? Well, the first thing they need to do is put in place my legislation. We're, we're going to come back and replenish Iron Dome. But the most importantly, the legislation I brought forward in the last Congress, which had it been signed then, had my Democrat colleagues joined me, they would have had to bring every one of the sanctions relief measures to the Congress and vote them up or down. Would the $10 billion have been released? By, you know, would we have okayed the $10 billion from Iraq to Iran? I doubt it. Certainly not the $6 billion that has gone for the hostages. And we would require the enforcement of the sanctions that were in place. And again, the estimates are as high as $80 billion of revenues from illegal petroleum sales because the Biden administration just refuses to enforce the sanctions. So that would be very important. We need to step back and stop fueling Israel's enemy, which is Israel's sworn enemy is Iran. And this administration has allowed them to gain the resources to fund their proxies like Hamas and Hezbollah. That's the first thing we need All right, to do. Republican Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee, thank you very much for joining us thank this you. evening. We want to continue the conversation on Israel now. Joining us is Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz of Florida, who just returned from Israel. Congresswoman, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Of course, a lot of us have read the reports. We have seen many of the videos coming out of the region at the moment, but you were there on the ground. Can you just share with us some of what you saw there? Thank you for having me, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the absolute savage butchery that occurred uh, starting on Saturday morning, perpetrated by Hamas, whose charter commands them to eradicate Israel and eliminate Jews across the globe. 
that's, that's the kind of organization of terrorists that we're dealing with here. And what we heard on the ground in Israel was in starting the trip, we met with the Saudi Arabian leadership, Bahrain leadership, Jordanian leadership, and to a person, uh, we were there both before in Saudi Arabia and after the attacks, they expressed you know, very real concern and opposition. There, certainly their statements, public statements, should, should and could have been more forceful, and we, we expressed that to them. But in our conversations one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it was very clear that they were um, absolutely uh, outraged by what the attacks and had been communicating that privately. But I, I want to address what Senator Haggerty just said, because what I, what I noted he left out, and this is not a time to make partisan uh, a absolute chance for unity, which is what is going on in Israel, despite their differences. I noted that he didn't mention that Pre former President Trump did the most damage to making sure that we kept Iran from a accessing and being able to launch a nuclear weapon when he withdrew us from the Iran nuclear de deal, the JCPOA. Um, instead, now today, they are nearly uh, a couple of weeks from breakout and that the sanctions regime that was in place, the intrusive inspections that were critical, were gone as a result of President Trump's irresponsible, unnecessary withdrawal. There's so much well, more that, that we need to do. We need to stay unified. Because it, it does seem, Congresswoman, like the rhetoric's getting pretty hot all the way around on here. On one side. Uh, instead on of, one side. Well, I, look, I, I, I won't get into that with you, but I just, I, I want to hear from you on the Biden administration's posture, now that particularly the Secretary of State has arrived in Tel Aviv and is traveling through the region. You're, you're checking what Senator Haggerty said. We've heard a lot of Republican lawmakers this week call out the administration for this $6 billion uh, for its posture, I guess, when it comes to Iran. Why don't you tell us your view on the role that the administration is playing now and should be playing as the House of Representatives seeks a speaker? Our delegation, led by Senator Joni Ernst, bipartisan, bicameral, uh, Jimmy Panetta, Donald Norcross were both with us, as were Daryl Issa and Marionette Miller-Meeks. We heard universally from Israelis, uh, especially Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and uh, opposition leader Lapid and others, that they were so thankful and appreciative for the universal, very focused, unified support of the Biden administration. Uh, today, we heard Secretary Blinken's re remarks that were very sober, very serious, very clear that Israel not only had the right, but the obligation to defend herself, that the United States would step up and be there all the way through the process. You know, words matter, but deeds and action matter more. And that is what has been notable throughout this entire last few days, and the appreciation and unity that is occurring, which we saw on the ground in Israel, and that is occurring across the globe of the civilized world, that is devoted and committed to destroying it, the Hamas terrorists who want nothing more than to destroy civilization. That's what this is all about. So, Congresswoman, we only have about a minute left, but for the U.S. to continue supplying Israel with what it needs, arguably you're going to need a speaker sometime soon to get aid through <laughs> Congress. Are we reaching a point, given the gravity of the situation, where Democrats might need to help that happen and get the gavel to Steve Scalise? You know, Democrats are united in support of Hakeem Jeffries, who has 212 rock-solid votes. Republicans are in chaos. At a time when we, in just a few short weeks, are going to need to step up and provide assistance to Israel, we have to make sure that we get the budget done before the CR runs, it runs out in 30, 36 days. We need the adults in the room, the Democrats, to be able to make sure that we can help, once again, come to the rescue of Republicans who are in chaos and dysfunction. I hope they decide who they're going to uh, nominate for speaker. We're going to be behind Hakeem Jeffries, and we, of course, stand ready. Are you ready seeking five to Republicans to vote for Hakeem Jeffries? Uh, 
we're seeking anyone who is, is ready to support Hakeem Jeffries and let us move forward because once again it's going to be very clear that because of Republican dysfunction we're going to have to make sure we pass the CR and we're going to have to make sure that we are the adults in the room, which we will do. We've got November 17th on our calendars. Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, we thank you for joining us live from Capitol Hill once again on Bloomberg. Coming up, Representative Michael McCall of Texas, the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, will be with us to continue the conversation. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. It seems that uh, I don't know that anyone can get 217 votes. That's the problem. I mean, you know, I, I, there's always seems to be a small faction who's opposed to anybody that we put up. And it's not always the same eight people. Republican Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis of New York speaking with us earlier on Bloomberg Sound On. This as Congress tries to work with the White House on an emergency supplemental spending package, including aid for Israel, aforementioned, as well as Ukraine, Taiwan, and border security. That leads us to our next guest, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Michael McCall, Republican from Texas. Mr. Chairman, welcome back to Bloomberg. It's good to see you, sir. Uh, as we yeah, consider the way forward here on funding, we have to ask about leadership, of course. And I wonder if you if you agree with uh, your colleague from New York that no one right now can get to 217. Well, uh, sadly, I think uh, she's correct. Um, I've never seen anything like this. And, and if we can't govern in this dangerous time, I can't think of anything more irresponsible. Uh, until we get a speaker in the chair, we can't pass my resolution condemning Hamas and supporting Israel. Uh, I also know, talking to my Israeli friends, that they're going to need an emergency aid package to replenish the Iron Dome. But if we don't have a speaker in the chair, uh, then we can't get them that assistance. So I think it's highly irresponsible uh, for us not to come together and unite around one candidate who can be Speaker uh, of the House. And, um, but that's unfortunately where we are. So I'm trying to find ways to get this stuff through because it's, we're talking, talking about a matter of weeks, not months, that we need to get mm -hmm. uh, an aid package, a national security package out uh, to help Israel defend itself. Um, and if we so, can't Mr. Chairman. play political games, it's so irresponsible. As you talk about the time frame here, I do have a timing question for you. How long should Steve Scalise be allowed to try to make this happen before the conference has to move on? Well, I think he's, um, you know, we aired out a lot of grievances. You know, at least I heard a lot of them today. Um, I made the call for in the na interest of the nation that we need to have Steve Scalise as speaker. Uh, but obviously he doesn't have the vote. So I would think, you know, he's given this week. Um, and uh, these are really uh, just there's another uh, possible path is to have a temporary speaker pro tem that could govern for the purpose of getting this national security package out um, that's going to be desperately needed in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, Mr. Chairman, I did raise the question of whether Congressman Patrick McHenry, who is currently serving in that pro temp role, should perhaps get more powers with a few of your colleagues today. This is what they had to tell me, if you could take a listen. Should Patrick McHenry have more power in the interim? Um, is that something being discussed? Some members have brought it up, but I, I, I just don't agree with that. I mean, the Speaker Pro Tem's role is clear and defined. Um, I think that um, I was trying to mess with that and play with that. I don't think it's in the right interest of the institution. That is not against Patrick at all. I think we'll have a speaker soon, and I think uh, he doesn't have the authority. I wonder what your response to that is, Congressman. Is it going to be necessary? Should the rules perhaps be bent or changed here? Where's how I see it? I, I don't think that's the ideal scenario. I think the ideal scenario is we, we nominate and elect a speaker on the floor who's in the chair. But we got a, a, a clock ticking uh, that's very dangerous, and it's, it's Israel. And if we can't get this aid package passed in time, uh, when that clock starts to wind down, I don't think we're going to have any other option but that, to have a 
a temporary pro tem speaker in place uh, to get what's in the best interest of our national security and our allies uh, passed by the Congress. And um, if, if eight or ten of uh, my conference can't agree on anything, uh, then they have left us no other option but that. Well, that would be a pretty remarkable turn of events, Mr. Chairman. I wonder from your perch now on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, and we should let our viewers know that you were the one who moderated the all-hands briefing for House members this week that the administration provided on Israel. I know that you've got, to your point, a resolution standing by, and there's going to be a funding request that follows. But can you speak to us about the intelligence here, or lack thereof, ahead of this attack? You spoke to the three-day lag between the time that Egypt gave intelligence to Israel about what could be a looming terror attack. Have you learned anything about what happened with that information? Well, you know, that's been reported by the Washington Post. It's not exactly a secret. Uh, now, the question is... Why wasn't I, it I acted that, upon, though? Well, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. I think it may have been passed at lower levels. Uh, from what I know of uh, Netanyahu, I know him very well, I think if he had had that type of intelligence, he would have acted upon it. Um, but the fact is, Hamas was preparing this for many months, we think six months to a year, without any indication or warning signs out there. And that's why I compare this to really kind of their 9-11. Uh, and if you look at it, it really is a surprise attack by terrorists. Um, and the amount of people they lost almost equates to what we lost, if not more. Um, and without, uh, you know, without that uh, awareness or intelligence. Uh, so there will be an examination, I'm sure, within the IC about what happened and why they didn't see this coming. I think right now we got to focus on the task at hand, and that's uh, what's happening right now in Gaza. Yeah, I, I, I do wonder what your assessment, Mr. Chairman, is of the time frame here. Are we looking at now an inevitable move on the ground of Israeli troops into Gaza? And what is to become mm -hmm. of the millions of Palestinians that live there and hostages that we think are being held there as well? So, you know, there's a unity uh, government now that uh, BB has set, uh, put together. Uh, the first phase of the operation was to destroy command and control operations throughout Gaza and munition supply bases and that sort of thing. The second phase is going to be far more difficult, and that's going in to Gaza, house to house, building to building, to either liberate hostages, will be held as human shields, by the way, which makes it extremely difficult, uh, but also to eliminate Hamas, the terrorists who are actually holding their own Palestinian population hostage as well. Um, that's been the mandate and order by uh, the Prime Minister of Israel. It's the execution of that that's going to be, I think, far more difficult to pull that off. I think from our perspective, yeah. the United States perspective, our objective is to contain this threat in the Gaza and not see it escalate to, say, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. They have 100,000 rockets that could easily overwhelm the Iron Dome. We don't want forces in Syria. In Iraq, that'd be ISIS or Iran back to Shia militias to get into this fight. We just saw Hamas call for a global jihad. So it's very, um, this is a very concerning time right now to see whether it can be contained or it's going to escalate. And finally, the operation in Gaza is not going to be a matter of days or even weeks. I think it's going to take months. Mr. Chairman, we appreciate your time. Uh, before you leave us, do you expect that there will be another Republican conference meeting on the matter of a speaker tonight? Uh, I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure we're going to have many, many more. Yes. We'd like to stay in touch with you on that. Congressman Michael McCall, we appreciate the time, as always, on Bloomberg. Coming up, President Biden is set to make his formal request for additional aid for Israel and Ukraine. Aforementioned, we'll be joined by our political panel to get into that a little bit more next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. It's simply depravity in the worst imaginable way. I think what it's done is, as I said, 
united a country in profound grief, but also united a country in resolve. And it's imperative that the rest of us share that resolve. That was Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking earlier today about the violence against Israelis. For more, let's bring in our political panel, Lester Munson, International BGR Government Affairs Principal, and Caitlin Legacki, partner at Four Corners Public Affairs and former senior advisor to Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. So thank you both very much for being here. Lester, just to begin with you, seeing the Secretary of State on the ground in Israel today, meeting with those who have been affected clearly, who have lost people that they were close to, kind of serving almost as a consoler in chief in this moment. What did you make of it? Well, I think it's terrifically important that he went there and was there in person and demonstrating not just that the U.S. is supporting Israel, but that we're going to be there with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that was important symbolism. I think uh, the secretary and the president have all been saying exactly the right things uh, and giving all the right indications uh, the movement of U.S. forces to be closer to the region to kind of give them an extra emphasis is also very important. So I think I think the administration actually has been pretty sure-footed on this so far. And that's uh, from a Republican speaking. We've been hearing a lot of cri criticism from Republican members uh, and some presidential candidates that the yeah. administration is somehow responsible yeah. uh, for th these attacks by way of its relationship or lack thereof with Iran. What should the White House be saying in terms of messaging on this? I, I mean, the White House is doing exactly the right thing. They are the adults in the room. They're being sober and serious. They recognize that this um, series of events that's happening right now is e extremely precarious. And what they are trying to do is operate in a way that recognizes the gravity of the situation, mm -hmm. but turns the temperature down, both to ensure that um, other actors in the region don't come into play, but then also to ensure that we're minimizing the loss of innocent life uh, among civilians, whether it's in Israel with further attacks or in uh, Gaza with the huge civilian population there. Well, and on that note, obviously the news today came in, in the form of $6 billion, which there had been growing calls, bipartisan calls, frankly, here in Washington for the administration to restrict that funding that they had released that was Iranian back to Iran. They now have an agreement with Qatar so that the money is not going to leave. It seems bowing in some way to that political pressure because the administration to this point, Lester, maintains that they do not have evidence at this point of Iran's direct involvement in the attacks. And I just wonder if addressing the political pressure on the one hand could have been provocative on the other hand. Well, I think it, whether there's evidence or not of Iran's direct involvement, let's be clear, Iran is a very strong supporter of Hamas. The things that happened over the weekend can be laid at Iran's foot at, at their doorstep. And I do think in the long run, a vigorous U.S. discussion about our policy in the Middle East with respect to Iran is badly needed. And hopefully we have a functioning two-party system in the very near future that allows us to have that debate. That would be quite a thing to witness. Uh, <laughs> listen to how uh, Benjamin Netanyahu got to this, the prime minister speaking earlier today, drawing comparisons between Hamas and ISIS. Hamas is ISIS, and just as ISIS was crushed, so too will Hamas be crushed. And Hamas should be treated exactly the way ISIS was treated. They should be spit out from the community of nations. No leader should meet them. No country should harbor them. And those that do should be sanctioned. Powerful uh, message, Caitlin. Does that help to bring it home uh, for Americans specifically who might have questions about funding uh, a military operation here in another country? Yeah, I, I think the administration is very clear that they are not eager to send American troops uh, into the additional American troops on the mm -hmm. ground. But what we are seeing is uh, helping Americans appreciate that proportionally. Israel lost many more civilians than we did on 9-11. And we all have very formative experiences and recollections of that. I think it's also valuable for those of us uh, here in America to keep that in mind as we work with Israel and other partners in the region to develop a response that seeks justice and not just retribution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, we spent 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq um, and I think, you know, because some of those emotions or decisions were made emotionally, 
um, and by focusing on who the real perpetrators are here um, and encouraging Israel to stay focused on that, I think it's hugely important for the U.S. As we were just hearing, Caitlin, from Prime Minister Netanyahu there, it, it reminded me that I intended to ask about the remarks that were made about Netanyahu and Israel more broadly last night by former President Donald Trump. One of the yeah. quotes, I will never forget that Bibi Netanyahu let us down. And he's, of course, referring to Soleimani. This was during the Trump administration, obviously. But he's gotten blowback from Ron DeSantis, who, of course, is running against him in the 2024 primary, as well as this administration for his remarks last night. What did you make of them? You know, I, I think because Donald Trump is no longer on Twitter every day, we sometimes forget that this was exactly the tone and tenor of his administration. And the reason he's getting that pretty vociferous blowback from Republicans is because these comments are out of line. They're not productive. They're not helpful. And all it does is turn the temperature up at a time when we need to be exercising restraint. Lester, do you have one thought on that? I, I would go further and say they're offensive and inappropriate and good for the Republicans who are challenging him. I hope they do it uh, more and more often because it's, it's simply not acceptable He's to speak that He's not speaking way. for a portion of the Republican base on this, is he? Hamas is very smart and Bibi let us down? Uh, I, I certainly hope not. I don't think he is. I think there will be some folks who rally to him just because he's doing the unexpected and being provocative and, and offensive. They seem to like that kind of thing. I don't think they agree with him on the, on the issue. I certainly hope they don't. All right. Well, speaking of issues, we know there are other issues they are dealing with at the moment on Capitol Hill. Former Speaker Kevin McCarthy, in addition, I would add, to former President Donald Trump, are casting doubt as to whether or not Louisiana Republican Steve Scalise can get the votes to become the next speaker. We'll have more on that next with our political panel that's sticking with us. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. We're going to be talking some more uh, as a smaller group, but a cross-section representing every swath of our conference. We have people, obviously, of different backgrounds that have different passions. We, for two and a half hours, talked through those. And I took every question that everybody brought, and we're going to continue to go through this process as we grow our support, work towards getting this resolved and getting the House back open. Yeah, they are no closer than they were this time yesterday. Louisiana Congressman Steve Scalise there, of course, Republican leader in the House addressing reporters after his conference meeting this afternoon. As we reassemble our political panel, Lester Munson, international BGR government affairs principal, and Caitlin Legacki, partner at Four Corners Public Affairs, former senior advisor to Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. Great to have you both at the table. Lester, I'm not sure how good this is looking for Steve Scalise. No closer to 217, it appears today than he was at this time yesterday. People are talking again about Kevin McCarthy coming back mm -hmm. around, maybe a caretaker speakership uh, with Patrick McHenry. Are you done with Steve Scalise already? Well, he didn't have a good day. I think, if anything, he lost support from yesterday to today, which is, which is not a, a terrific thing. And it does sound like these meetings have been very chaotic and without any kind of resolution. Michael McCall could barely even answer us when we <laughs> asked him if they had another meeting. He was so distraught. It looked yeah, I, like. think, I think it was emotionally traumatic for a lot of people. <laughs> uh, so it, it doesn't look good for him. I, you can't rule out him kind of rallying here. He does, he does have a lot of sentimental value to Republicans, given you know he was shot uh, a near assassination yeah. attempt in 2017. He's got some health challenges. He's a likable guy, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't rule him out, but it, he had a tough day today. Hmm. He did. And of course, as we are talking about what we just talked about Michael McCall, with Michael McCall, he also said that he may, no one may be able to get 217 right. votes, that there is a very real possibility that there just isn't that kind of well, consensus just not a working plan. in the Republican conference right now. And, and Caitlin, it raises the question of the Democrats. Yeah. You had Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the congresswoman from New York, saying, hmm, five Republicans should just vote Jeffries <laughs> right. would solve this problem. How likely is that? Or how likely is it that you could actually have some Democrats deciding, all right, enough's enough, let's get a speaker? Yeah, I, look, I, I'm sure uh, Congressman Jeffries would be, major, Minority Leader Jeffries would be open to that. I, I think it is unlikely. Um, you know, this reminds me a lot of McCarthy's speaker vote. It reminds me a little bit of, you know, my nieces were like, sometimes you just have to let them cry through it, and then you'll get to the eventual outcome. 
Um, <laughs> but, you know, as, as Chairman McCall said, we are in serious times right now. And, you know, the Republican caucus has to decide whether or not they want to govern. Um, and if they don't want to govern, then, you know, there's a number of Republicans in Biden districts that could very easily work with um, Minority Leader Jeffries to have a functioning government. Is that reality, Lester? Because we don't get a lot of reaction when we ask lawmakers about this idea of crossing the aisle to solve this problem. But how many weeks until it seems like an inevitable solution? I really think the House Republicans have to come to a solution by Saturday or Sunday. There are too many important issues they have to deal with. Uh, aid to Israel is is an immediate concern. The the strike, the UAW strike. We were talking about some of these issues during the break. There are there are things they have to do. The, <clears throat> Congress can't act unless there's a speaker in place and a functioning House of Representatives. The Senate can't just step in and do all the things right. for the House. <laughs> uh, so they've got to get their act together. I don't think it's realistic that five Republicans are going to vote for uh, no. Mr. Jeffries okay. for speaker at all. But I but they've got to get their act together. It may need to go to a guy like Tom Emmer, who's a little bit removed from leadership uh, and maybe hasn't gotten too burned by the recent fights to to unify folks. But they're going to have to do it in the next 48 hours, I think. Okay, so the clock's ticking here, Caitlin. There's also the question of whether or not they just extend whatever it is that Patrick McHenry can do as Speaker Pro Tem. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that is perhaps the most realistic scenario, ultimately? It seems very untenable. I think if we get to a desperate situation, they'll start to consider it. But it's clear that the Republican caucus would rather go through this process and find a permanent speaker than have to do this every 60 or 90 days. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Lester, you say 48 hours. There's no indication that that could happen. So what, what breaks the logjam here? Does Donald Trump have to come to Washington after all? Well, he has he has volunteered to be kind of the the emergency candidate, I suppose. Uh, I think I think they they just need to look at each other. They probably need to stay up late. Uh, They probably need to get tired. They need to to vent their spleens and and, um, (laughs) you know, send the babysitters home and uh, work this thing out themselves. And hopefully they can do it. Time to bring in the cuts. All right. Lester Munson and Caitlin Legacki, we have to leave it there. But thank you both very much for joining us this evening. And of course, for more coverage, check out the Washington edition newsletter. You can get that on the terminal and online. It's Friday, they say tomorrow. We'll check back with you then on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.